Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, yeah, folks, we are back. It is Monday night, April 1st, 2019. This is the Grim Leftovers program. I am your host, Grimnir, and uh, yeah, we're live on this Monday. So welcome to everybody out there that may be listening in from wherever they may be listening in from. Uh, it's always good to have you here with us. And and you should know, or you should note, that I did indeed get my uh, sound fixed. Yes, I got, I got a new sound card. Uh, it's basically a direct replacement of the one that went bad when I started searching for a new one. Uh, although it's slightly different. It's supposed to be the pro edition rather than the edition I had, which is oh, 15, 20 years old. So uh, anyway, I'm glad to have it. Uh, and, and it's working. Everything seems to be working good in all the various applications that I use. And I do use a lot of them um, to do various broadcasting with. So uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm just happy that it's going and it's good. If anybody's got any comments about the audio sound quality, please let me know there in the chat. I'd appreciate that uh, because, you know, I, I I can only hear from my end. I can't hear from what you're hearing out there. So hopefully everything is aces or five by five, as people say. So anyway, welcome to everybody on the various sites out there, freedomsnetwork.com. RealLiberty.org, RLMRadio.xyz, uh, wherever else you may be tuned in from. And if you're not over here on RealLibertyMedia.com in the chat or just on Freenode, if you access it via your own IRC client, then come on over, jump on in. This is where all the people hang out at. Yeah, we got a great group of folks there. We got some bot bots and bodies, as Flash likes to say. We got Barman, and we got myself and the Mighty Moose Girl. We got Miss Kate and Aunt and Asmo and Chalcedony and Gramsci, Don C and Java Doctor in Meester Brow, Mr. Ponder Gander, uh, Miss Rain and Rob Works and Rome's and the, the Vanna White Bot. Yes, she's very handy. Uh, Vin E, the weather dork bot that just tells you the weather pretty much. That's all he does. Uh, we got Z about the Z. We got the Phantom and Beetle in the Bot Trainer, a.k.a. many other names. Uh, Colfax 101, the Cyborg Noodle, Mr. Dakota. Mr. Dakota? I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's see. It's, uh, maybe I have, I'll put up a tad. Okay, I'll get that in a minute. Uh, we got Frumpy and got Gooberzilla, the Gromit and JJ's. And uh, Kozu, Carl Marx is a, apparently an AI bot. That's learning how we talk in here. We got Kiss. We got Pwn Sauce in Sock Puppet and Salamo. All right, let me uh, adjust up the uh, audio here a little tad or three. Check, check, check. Yeah, it looks good. All right, that should be better. <laughs> All right, I got a bunch of good stories lined up here for you. For those of you new to the program, if you are, if there is anybody still out there new to the program, I think this is episode 16, so... People should be getting used to the concept here for a while. But, uh, yeah, if you're new to the program, this the, this, sto this program is for the stories that I had bookmarked to be read, to be covered on the Freaker's Ball, which is the Friday night program that myself and the Mighty Moose Girl do. Uh, and and we tell, we tell some news stories on there or various other stuff. And uh, I, 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 I mark more than we get to. So I made this show to try and soak up some of the excess like bacon grease <laughs> or maybe or maybe pizza grease because as we kick it off here tonight we're going to kick it off with a story from fox29.com which was posted on february 24th of this year nutritionist says pizza healthier than breakfast cereal so when you get up in the morning and you're looking at your bowl of Special K or grape nuts or Wheaties or whatever the hell it is you eat, maybe you just want a piece of pizza instead. That might work out better for you. That's right. Captain Crunch or Papa John's? Fruit Loops or Domino's? 
Those might sound like strange questions, but the answers could change morning routines for you or your children. Some cereals may be magically delicious, but a New York nutritionist says a slice of pizza could be more nutritional way for kids to start the day. And you too, by the way. Uh, Chelsea Anner says a slice of slice of pizza contains more fat but less sugar than most cereals, and an average slice in a bowl of milk contain about the same amount of calories. Pizza slices also contain more protein, which means pizza will hold your appetite down and not give you a crash from coming off of the sugar high. Amir says she's not advocating pizza as your usual breakfast staple. Well, if you put bacon on it, then, then it's all right. Oh, rather, she is just pointing out pizza as a better option. Better than both, Amur suggests Greek yogurt with fruit or oatmeal with cinnamon, which I'm not really a big fan of yogurt, but, you know, whatever, it's fine. And uh, oatmeal with cinnamon is quite tasty, uh, certainly certainly on that. So, uh, anyway, um... <laughs> There you go. Have some pizza for breakfast. <laughs> oh, anyway, I, 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 never fear the bacon. Absolutely, Salamo. Never fear the bacon. The bacon is good stuff. <laughs> All right. Oh, now we're into the tech world here. Uh, this posted on February twenty fifth this year from yourminds.org. Four artificial intelligent robots slaughtered 29 scientists in a lab in Japan. Now, I don't think we have to worry so much about our bots slaughtering any of the chatters. But you never know. It could be like a verbal slaughter that could happen. <laughs> oh, blocked arteries. Nah. Fat's good for you, man. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, this is Linda Moltenhow uh, says, I received a phone call from a whistleblower in the Intel world I've known for about a year and a half. He is honorably discharged from the Marines, but he continues to work on contracts with the CIA, NSA, DIA agencies. I always keep notebooks all over my house, my office, my car, everywhere that so that I can write stuff down during a phone call that I can't record when I'm not in my studio to record. So I wrote this down word for word. At a top robotics company in Japan this week, four robots being developed for military applications killed 29 humans in the lab. And they did, did it by shooting what he called metal bullets. Is there another kind of bullet? I guess a rubber bullet, but that's not going to kill you. Plastic bullet, not going to kill you. So, yeah, I would think metal bullet would be the one that would kill you. Anyway, the scariest part of uh, th part of it is that lab workers deactivated two of the robots, took apart a third, but the fourth began restoring itself and somehow connected to an orbiting satellite to download information about how it could rebuild itself even more strongly than before. As And this next sentence is a quote. I'm writing this down. I've been doing this for years. This is serious shit, Linda, but you're never going to hear about it in the news. The robotics company has too much to lose, and the government wants AI robot soldiers. Yeah. And there's a video here um, that you can check out, too. But, uh... Is it true? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and I know you're thinking, well, hell, this is this is April Fool's Day. Maybe he's, he's just playing a joke on us. But no, like I said, this article was posted on February 25th. So uh, this is not part of the April Fool's thing. But speaking of April Fool's, <laughs> today being April Fool's Day, I look up at my calendar here. Oh, I'm on the wrong month. Maybe that's why. <laughs> okay, I was. I looked up at my calendar here, and I saw. I looked at the first day of the month. I didn't. For, I didn't realize I hadn't changed the calendar day, uh, month yet. Anyway, 
it, 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 for the first day of the month, it says Employee Appreciation Day. And I thought, well, that's a good joke. <laughs> Employee Appreciation Day. Who are they fooling? <laughs> Oh, okay. It doesn't list April Fool's Day on the calendar when I flip it to the next month, but that's, that's kind of funny. Um, I, it does sound April Foolish, Salamo, but uh, I, Linda's been doing stuff, doing uh, covering some really weird news for a long time. If you listen to a show, Coast to Coast AM, that comes on late nights on, on the radio, uh, different stations in your area, but uh, if you listen to that show... On the fourth Thursday of every month, you'll hear Linda Moulton Howe uh, on there for three hours. So uh, you can check her out and uh, see what she's all about. But uh, her stories usually come out pretty accurate. So that being that, robots, huh, how about this? Biomimetics, when ro robotics imitate nature. Robot C, Robot Do. <laughs> this is on uh, techacute.com from March 8th. Art imitating nature, or perhaps nature imitating art. It's an old discussion and one that has been going on for a long time. Technology is much the same in this regard, especially when it comes to robotics. We've been building robots for a long time, and we've been getting more and more creative with it. Inspiration can come from many places after all, and one of the most popular sources of inspiration is nature. More specifically, the animal kingdom. There are some fascinating creatures in the world, and many of them have spectacularly clever traits and abilities achieved through millennia of evolution and natural selection. The, the term for learning from nature or adapting uh, natural designs as part of machine learning uh, experience is also referred to as biomimetics or biomimicry. The arachnid inspiration. It was only a question of time before people started copying those abilities to make them, their machines more efficient. And sometimes, just for the hell of it, because it's fun. This is the case with the Bionic Wheelbot built by Festo. It's modeled after the so-called Flick Flack Spider that, rather than walking on its eight legs, folds them into a circle and wheels across the ground to, to cover large distances. Three sets of two legs each are curled uh, while the last two are used to push off, both by the robots and the Flick Flack Spider. The Bionic Wheelbot doesn't currently have any practical applications but it does a great job of mimicking the effective and unique way the desert-dwelling Flick Flack Spider travels. What now? I need to change up the fly-out times? I don't know what that means. What's a fly-out time and, and why do I need to change it? Sock? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Uh, Reptilia Inspiration. For a slightly more practical type of robot, you could look at the Snakebot. Developed by Carnegie Mellon University, the robot emulates a snake very closely. It is made up of connected joints that allow it to slither the way a snake can, including lifting its head and looking around. The 16 joints are connected uh, per Snakebot and allow it to perform all sorts of movements and tasks. These robots are being considered for use in space travel because of their versatility. In other words, although it may not be snakes on a plane, motherfucking snakes on a motherfucking plane, um, it could soon be snakes on spaceships. And that's a sequel idea, if we've ever heard one. Then there's the Insecta inspiration. There are many bees. NASA announced last year that they are developing robotic bees, Mars Bee, in order to explore Mars in ways that the rover can't. They are going to be able to detect methane, which could be a sign of life. These bees haven't been revealed yet, but they are in development, and so it may not be too long before the first batch is sent to the Red Planet. 
And they, then we have something called Kondo Ricketites, Ricketites Inspiration. I don't know how to say that word. Uh, when it comes to exploration, there are two big unknowns in, in the world, space and the oceans. We still haven't explored vast areas of our planet, despite our best efforts to do so. There are places humans simply can't travel to. But luckily, there are robots to help with this, too. Oh, fly out times for the ducks. Yeah, whatever. I ain't too worried about the ducks. <laughs> one example, one such example is the Manta Droid. No, not the sub-fighter from Star Wars. Uh, built by researchers from the National University of Singapore. Uh, the bot swims like a manta ray. It uses flexible fins that give it the agility and streamlined design that allows real mantas to travel vast parts of the ocean, though still experimental. These manta droids might help with underwater searches and gathering marine data in the near future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got duck hunt. I, I don't worry about duck hunt during my show. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, there you go. Uh, tech, techacute.com. All right. Robots, robots, brains. Yep, here's one from futurism.com. Posted up here on January 12th of this year. Scientists are building a quantum computer that acts like a brain. Get ready for the quantum neural network. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> a new research product project aims to harness the power of the quantum computers to build a new type of neural network. Work, the researchers say, could usher in the next generation of artificial intelligence. My colleagues and I hope to build and uh, hope in, in, and I instead hope to build the first dedicated neural network computer using the latest quantum technology rather than AI software. Uh, according to Michael Hartman, a professor at Harriet Wet University, who's leading the research in a new essay for the conversation, which is apparently a magazine of some sort, by combining uh, these two branches of computing, we hope to produce a breakthrough which will lead to AI that operates at unprecedented speed, automatically making very complex decisions in a very short time. Yeah, I'm not real, um, I may not uh, be totally in favor of that. A neural network is a type of machine learning algorithm loosely modeled on the biological brain, which learns from examples in order to deal with its new inputs. Quantum computers take advantage of these subatomic particles that can exist in more than one state at a time, not unlike Schrodinger's cat, uh, to circumvent the limitations of the old-fashioned binary computers. By combining the two, Hartman believes his team will be able to jumpstart a new era in AI research that could manage extraordinarily com complex problems like directing traffic flow for an entire city in real time. Which I'm fine with that until they start crashing cars into each other. Yeah. Any of y'all ever see the movie Maximum Overdrive? And those weren't even computers. <laughs> To date, quantum computers have struggled to solve problems that are a piece of cake for classical computers. But uh, if they start to pull ahead, Hartman and his team would be prepared to leverage them for the next epoch of AI systems. To put the technology to its full use with, will involve creating larger devices, a process that may take 10 years or more, as many technical details need to be very precisely controlled to avoid computational errors, Hartman wrote. But once we have shown that quantum neural networks can be more powerful than classical AI software in a real-world application, it would very quickly become some of the most important technology out there. And Skynet was born.
Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we are we are actually beyond the date for Skynet to become alive, um, as it was in the movie, Ter- the Terminator. Um, but you know they never quite get the dates right in those movies. But uh, yeah, I, I, I have a little bit of trepidation, would you say, about allowing uh, these machines to uh, have that much control, especially because we know that. Many scientists, they will do because they can do. They will try to do everything they possibly can. And they don't really give so much care about ethics. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) All right. And this one, just because it's funny. I I, I think it's funny. I don't know. Maybe it's not funny, but it's funny to me. From the dailymail.co.uk. Yeah. Major translation website is condemned after offering anti-Semitic and racist explanations of words. Oh, no. The horror. (laughs) Reverso, I guess that's the name of the site. Uh, said it will carry out a complete revision of all potential risky terms because somebody might get butt hurt. It has a context feature which gives example of how to use words in a sentence. One uh, one offered example of how to use Jew said, there are too many Jews here. Well, where was he? Where was the guy standing when he got the comment, there are too many Jews here. Was he at like a, a, a Catholic sermon and there was a bunch of Jews hanging out? Well, in that case, there's too many Jews there. They don't belong there in a, in a Catholic church. We don't know that information. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, so a major translation website was condemned on Friday for offering up shocking anti-Semitic and racist, racist explanations of words. Users who typed nicer into Reverso looking for a French equivalent were offered the example, Hitler was a lot nicer to the Jews than they deserved. (laughs) A search of much nicer produced the results, Dachau was much nicer than Auschwitz. Oh, boy. (laughs) The French-based service used more than 45 million people a month, used by more than 45 million people a month, threw up equally hateful results for the word Jew. Examples for, of, of how the word is used included, there are too many Jews here, here is the ultimate example of how Jews control America, and this is why the Jews are so dangerous. Translating Jew into Italian brought up, we will knock on the door of the mosques with Jewish skulls. While a a search in German on Muslim threw up the result, a good Muslim always keeps his mouth shut. A search done by AFP on the French word for blacks gave the translation known fact, blacks move in, crime goes up. And to be fair, most animals hate black people. (laughs) <laughs> oh these guys who wrote the, their 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 translations <laughs> or their examples anyway a search in english gave he was he was shot by two blacks outside a garage uh, an international league against racism and anti-semitism known by its french acronym licra l-i-c-r-a condemned Reverso, saying its examples of translations were dripping in anti-Semitism. I didn't even know it was a liquid. It called for immediate action to fix the problem. The site's founder, Theo Hoffenberg, said that its machine uh, translating tools had never been known to slip up so badly. Well, maybe it wasn't a slip up. Maybe you had a kind of a, a rogue programmer there. Anyway, we have never had such a shocking examples that need such rapid correction, he added. Hoffenberg promised to correct the unfortunate and horrible examples pointed out by Licra within hours and said the site would be carrying out a complete revision 
of all possible, potentially risky terms and words. Ooh, it's a risky term, risky word. <laughs> he said the billions of examples of how words can be translated in, in its context feature were managed by algorithms based on common expressions and problems set by linguist, linguists. Uh, Reverso uses uh, subtitles from films and internet videos to replicate the most common. If he's using YouTube videos for some of this, uh, that could be part of his problem. Uh, the most commonly used phrases from natural speech. Well, I depend. I guess depending on where you're standing and who's talking, uh, the natural speech phrases are going to change on you. Hoffenberg said that the site is not corrected in real time, but every few weeks based upon feedback and recommendations from several thousands of its users. Reversa was set up in 1998 to provide online translation and linguistic services, including dictionary, spell checking, conjugation tools. <sighs> anyway, um, the site previously got into hot water in 2015 for offering up pornographic explanations for certain German words. <laughs> As in Hans means Fuckhead. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> it's all funny stuff out there ain't it let's see if anybody's saying anything to me here in the chat that I missed out on as I'm going through does it look like it they're all yakking about who knows what yeah sometimes the chat is just the chat and they're not talking about the show all right from a website called thevaccinereaction.org. Uh huh. Vaccine mandates. Ignoring human rights and informed consent. Uh, this was Barbara Casares, I guess that's how you say her name. Published March 7th, 2019. Quit moving around on me. All right. The United States Senate Health and Education Labor and Pensions Committee held a, a hearing on March 5th, 2019, titled Vaccines Save Lives. What does what is driving preventable disease outbreaks? The hearing was called Vaccines Save Lives. The very title of the hearing tips the committee's hand. Vaccine saves lives is a conclusive statement. Sock Puppet asked me if I have ever listened to someone cuss in German. I, um, not that I'm aware of. I think they could have been cussing and I just didn't know it. Anyway, so the, the, the term vac or the phrase vaccine saves lives is a conclusive statement that preemptively answers the question that follows, making it clear there would be no divergent exploration of the question of what is driving preventable disease outbreaks. Even further, while it is true that some vaccines may save some lives, it is also true that vaccines are not studied for their intended long and short term effects on the body and that many people's bodies respond to vaccines in ways that are very harmful to them. <clears throat> the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, or VICP, has paid out more than $4 billion for vaccine injuries since 1998. The Passive Reporting System for Vaccine Injuries, VAERS, or Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which captures between 1 and 10% of all adverse reactions, receives thousands of reports of injury every single year. If vaccines are saving lives, they are also doing it at the expense of those who are injured or killed by those very same vaccines. Where the hell's the greater good than that? The testimonies of uh, those elected to give witness in the Senate hearing 
all beat the very same totally predictable drum. More mandates for more vaccines to be given to more people. There was a push to curtail parental rights and eliminate vaccine exemptions to those vaccines. Who will be allowed to speak in Congress uh, to the issue of human rights, the ethic of medical informed consent, and the right to bodily integrity and autonomy when it comes to vaccine mandates? The United States has confronted and repudiated the ugliness that comes with eugenics, utilitarianism, and medical experimentation in the labs at Tuskegee and the courts of Nuremberg following the horrors of Nazi medical experimentation on human subjects. It is a violation, pure and simple, a violation of human rights to use people as guinea pigs in the great vaccine experiment. It is immoral, absolutely freaking immoral, for the government to, co to collude with pharmaceutical companies through the use of vaccine mandates. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, now recommends 69 doses of 16 vaccines be given to children before the age of 18, with hundreds of vaccines in the pipeline. Many of these vaccines are fast-tracked for approval without adequate safety studies. Each carries both known and unknown risks. Although it is currently in fashion to think otherwise, the science is not settled on vaccines. The science is not settled on anything. Science cannot be settled. There is not adequate testing on vaccines to make assurances of safety, New vaccines are usually tested against other vaccines, not inert placebos. There, have, there has never been a true scientifically credible study of those who are vaccinated to compared, compared to those who are completely unvaccinated. Vaccines are a medical intervention given to healthy people that carry a risk of death or serious or debilitating consequences for some individuals. Because of this risk, there must always be a choice. So you, there you are, perfectly healthy Joe Blow, and you walk into some place because you've been instructed to by your television to go in there and, and accept certain injections of vaccines into your perfectly healthy body. And then you become ill or you become disabled in some manner. And they mandate, or they're trying to mandate this as far as they possibly can to make every, to force everyone to be totally vaccinated to what they will tell you are their standards, although their standards are not standards because they've never actually been validated. There was no one on the panel of witnesses at the March 5th Senate hearing who gave a voice to that point of view. Why, why was Barbara Lowe Fisher of the National Vaccine Information Center, a longtime advocate of vaccine safety and an expert on vaccine policy and informed consent, not called to testify? Why was a high school student who has spoken with friends and done a bit of Google research asked to participate in a hearing of such serious magnitude when parents of vaccinated injured children, vaccine in injured children, people who vaccinated their children in good faith and paid a horrible price have been left out of the conversation. If we applaud this child's right to make medical choices, shouldn't the choices of informed parents who have uh, come to a different conclusion also be included? Are we abandoning the fundamental American value of intelligent dissent in favor of totalitarianism? Yes, yes, <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. Oh, it's not hard to conclude that this hearing was set up as a one-sided, unfair, and incomplete conversation with a predetermined outcome. Not hard at all. She will close with the words of Dr. Christine Stabel Ben, a vaccine researcher and professor of global health at the University of Southern Denmark. Dr. Ben's opinion was published in the Times of London 
March 2nd, 2019, in a response to the previous article about vaccine hesitancy. As a vaccine researcher, I strongly oppose mandatory vaccination. The vaccines that are, are, are in use were only tested for effects on the vaccine-targeted disease and on side effects in relation to the vaccination. However, there is increasing evidence that the vaccines also affect the immune system broadly, reducing or enhancing susceptibility to unrelated diseases. Hence, the vaccine skeptics have a right to point out that we do not know the full effects of vaccines on the overall health. It should, therefore, be a human right to weigh the pros and cons of unknowns and make one's own decision. Period. End of story. So when you're when you're told you your kid can't go to a school or uh, if you can't work at a certain place if you work in a certain profession because you're not vaccinated to the to the way that these people say maybe maybe just point out stuff like this here it's all fixed it's all rigged it's it's all major game and uh, all right I'm digging back on this next story here let me get a sip of water. Digging back a little bit because it it came up in there in the chat at some point some weeks ago uh, about the term um, climate change versus global warming and how they changed it from global warming, which they were using, to climate change because, well, there just wasn't any warming. So we can just blame any kind of weird stuff on climate change, but is the climate actually changing or just cycling as it does normally? And of course the answer is, it's just cycling as it does normally. But what if you have a certain year, a certain time, where it seems, I say seems, like there's things going on with the weather that you may think are out of the ordinary. Oh, this has never been seen before. This is record. This is massive. But it's not that it's never happened. It's just that you don't recall it. Humans tend to have some some pretty pretty short memories uh, when it comes to things like the weather. Because no matter what year it is, in the dead of winter, you're going to say, I've never been this cold before. In the In the peak of summer... You're going to swear it's the hottest day that's ever existed anywhere. But it's not. So, they came up with this a concept. And this article is on sciencemag.org from 2014, May 2nd, 2014. And the headline says, Let's call it Climate Disruption. White House science advisor suggests again, <laughs> and you may be familiar with the guy because <laughs> he is a eugenicist. Yes, and he was the White House science advisor, a eugenicist. 2014, so you know that was the Obama era for those of you that want to tie in that little Looney Tune bit of stuff uh, as if Obama or Bush or, or Trump or Clinton or Reagan or the other Bush or whoever has, has any say in and who's actually put in there in these positions. Oh, boy. <laughs> First, there was global warming. Then many researchers suggested climate change was a kinder, gentler term because there's no actual warming. Now, the White House science advisor, John Holdren, is renewing his call for a new nomenclature to describe the end result of dumping vast quantities of carbon dioxide and what they call here, other heat-trapping gases into Earth's atmosphere. Global climate disruption. And if I may segue a moment. Heat-trapping gases. No such thing 
It's nonsense. Anyway, going on with the article. <laughs> I've always thought that the phrase global warming was something of a misnomer because it suggests that the phenomena is something that is uniform around the world and that it's all about temperature and that it's gradual. Holdren said yesterday at the annual AAAS forum uh, on science and technology policy in Washington, D.C. What could be wrong with that? Instead, he said, we should call it global climate disruption. Although the rising average global surface temperature is an indicator of degrees of disruption that we have imposed on the global climate system, what's actually happening involves changes in circulation patterns, changes in precipitation patterns, and changes in extremes. And those are very different in different places. And they're all imaginary. <laughs> oh, it's cyclic there, you moron. Anyway, Holdren has made similar calls before, apparently with limited effect on the public's vocabulary. This time, the remarks came in the context of a brief preview holding uh, Holdren gave on a new climate report that the Obama administration was scheduled to release that week. This document will, in part, spell out the potential disruptions, potential, potential, disruptions that the United States faces as a result of climate change perhaps giving Holdren the idea for some currency. No, no, his idea has no currency. It never took off. Like I said, this was five years ago, and it never took off. I remember reading about it because it really made me laugh. Climate disruption? What the hell are you talking about? Somebody flicked the power switch off and on? <laughs> Is this coitus interruptus? Uh, climate climate interruptus? Uh, anyway. In his remarks, Holdren was also bullish on the potential of alternative energy sources to replace fossil fuels. fuels. Again, they're not fossil fuels, but most people believe they are. Even people I know that understand that global warming is a hoax still think of oil and, and other similar things as fossil fuels, as if you're dredging up dinosaur guts to power your car. Nonsense! <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, gas emissions will involve developing a variety of energy sources, including renewables, nuclear, and fossil fuel technologies, with carbon capture and storage, he said in response to a question from the audience. But nobody has a crystal ball. Well, we got a magic eight ball here in the chat, but that's different. But nobody has a crystal ball to know when the when that mix will will emerge from the efforts to raise uh, each of these such options to its highest potential. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> these these are the type of Looney Tunes that they hire to set policy for for things like what how they can control the climate and what you what your effect upon the climate is because you're a dirty filthy human and you need to be dealt with in the harshest manner the very strict manner you need to be controlled and regulated and taxed and fined because you're breathing and farting and eating food that was that required energy to grow <laughs> exactly cyborg <coughs> excuse me all right, this article published three weeks ago here on betanews.com. Um, I, I, I haven't seen it yet. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but, I, but I, I, I personally have not seen it yet. But according to this, Microsoft will pester Windows 7 users to upgrade to Windows 10 with pop-up notifications. Much like they did back when Windows 10 first rolled out. Remember, you would get little pop-ups shooting up there. <laughs> See, even Magic 8-Ball doesn't know if I have a crystal ball. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, this, 
if you see these, don't be alarmed. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, anyone who is still using Windows 7, I raise my hand. I'm speaking to you via a Windows 7 machine right now. And uh, I am not going to switch to Windows 10. I will eventually switch to full-on uh, Linux systems, which I have one Linux and, and one Windows system here on my machine or on my desktop, my physical hard desktop, not the computer desktop. Uh, so anyone still using Windows 7 does not have much longer until the operating system is no longer supported by Microsoft. And you say, meh, who cares? There's people out there, and I know them right here, still using older systems, XP. So, some people still use Windows 2000 uh, and, and other versions of Windows that are old and have been not supported by Windows for a long ass time. Big deal. Anyway, Microsoft, is, Microsoft has already done a lot to encourage to force people, Windows 7 diehards, to make the move to Windows 10. And now it's stepping things up a gear. Throughout 2019, the company will show pop-up notifications at Windows 7 without making the switch to the latest version of Windows. In a blog post, Microsoft Corporate Vice President Matt Barlow explains at the end of the support for Windows 7 means there will be no more updates issued to most people and this is why it's important to upgrade. It don't matter. It don't matter. It says, to the most secure Windows ever. Well, it's secure for Microsoft. But is it secure for you? Is Windows 10 secure for you? No, the answer is absolutely not. And the reason not is because Microsoft has full access to your machine. <laughs> and they take that information from your machine and they share it with whoever's going to give them money for it. So if you start seeing these little pop-ups coming up in your computer, if you're on a Windows, if you're running Windows 7 still, meh, don't worry about it. Leave it. Let it be. Let it be. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot I put this story in here. <laughs> this story, I love this story. And I, I may not have gone to this extreme that this guy did. I might have just pulled over and kicked the guy out the door if he was in my car doing this, but choking somebody? Probably not. Car pad, oh, this is, by the way, it's on uh, NewYorkPost.com on uh, March 11th. Car passenger choked driver for singing Christmas carols. <laughs> I fully understand the frustration of that passenger. And I, I would have said, I'm going to walk. Just let me out here. Let me out here. I'm not, I'm, I'm out of your car. <laughs> I don't want to have, have anything to do with you sitting there singing friggin' Christmas carols. <laughs> a Pennsylvania man who was seemingly not in the Christmas spirit last week was arrested after he allegedly assaulted a man for singing festive songs, according to reports. Clayton Lewis, 25, was a passenger a car, in a car uh, driving down Route 28 in East Deer Township, northeast of Pittsburgh, on March 4th when the altercation broke out, citing a criminal complaint. The driver of the car reportedly was singing Christmas carols, which upset Lucas. He allegedly reached around the driver's seat and began choking him to the point where he almost lost consciousness, according to the news outlet. While Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State Police tried to arrest Lucas, he allegedly would not cooperate and refused to listen to their orders before he was eventually taken into custody. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I, I sympathize, buddy. I do. I, I, I would certainly... I would certainly feel like choking the person but I, I think just you know 
Just let me the hell out of the car. I, I don't care. I don't want to be any part of that. If I was the driver and the passenger started singing, I'd pull over and, and he'd be gone. He'd be out the door. He'd be toast. History. <laughs> All right. Well, it's spring, you know, and it's spring now. And, and being spring means that if you're going to plant stuff in your yard, garden, uh, it's the time, it's time to start getting that done. Some of you, depending on where you live, it's already past that time. For me, it's just getting to that time. And for some of you, uh, that time will come a little later if you're up in the more uh, northern cold climes than, than where I am. But for example, yesterday it snowed here. Yeah, it snowed. It was like 60 to 70 degrees all week last week. A couple of days actually in the 70s. And then yesterday we get snow. Not really time to have plants growing outside because they will die when the snow comes down upon them. So what you got to do is start some, some, some of your plants inside. I came across a site where they, uh, they, they, they tell you what the, what the planting times are. They help you plot out a garden, how to lay it out and all that stuff. It's kind of cool. Um, I don't, I don't have it right here with me. I'll, maybe I'll throw it into the blog, but I don't have a, a link for you, but it was kind of cool. It lets you lay it out and it tells you what, which, which plants grow, uh, when you, when you want to start planting them inside, when you want to transplant them, when you want to start the ones that start outside, outside, uh, how much space each of them needs, what kind of, uh, pests you can expect from each one. Um, and, and when does to begin harvest uh, on, on each of the plants. So it was pretty cool. But anyway, I came across this, uh, this site here or this article here a, a while ago. And it's from uh, dengarden.com on uh, May of 2016. And it's handy. It's a handy thing for those of you that may want to do some indoor planting ahead of time. So here it is. How to use a cardboard egg container to make a seed start seed starting tray. Now, I have some flats that I've been saving for years, egg flats. That held, I don't know, what, two two dozen eggs or three dozen eggs? A bunch of eggs. Uh, maybe maybe 30. I don't know how many eggs, but they're, they're good, big, big, square cardboard flats. And you can put them in the, in the, in the places. Uh, you know, cut them up in the, into certain things and uh, write down on the side or put a sticker on there or whatever. Whatever you're going to start in, the, in these cardboard containers. So it's called do-it-yourself or DIY seed starting trays a seed starting tray is a small container where you put garden soil or other materials used to germinate seeds so that you can give plants a proper care until they're ready to be moved to the ground or to a larger pot uh, because these egg trays are not big it's easy to control their environment to help plants grow the best conditions uh, watering temperature light etc in geographic areas where winters are so cold that young plants cannot survive. You can start your seeds inside of your house or other predicted areas, pr protect, protected areas, uh, and be ready to transplant quite a few seedlings when the weather permits instead of just starting everything from scratch. There are several ways and materials you can use to start making your own seed starting trays, but my favorite is the cardboard egg box. Anyway, she goes through and she uh, tells you exactly how to you know, cut cut them into size and how to label them, uh, what what kind of uh, uh, dirt and such to put in each one, how deep to plant the seed, uh, how to water properly, uh, how you can cover them up with plastic to protect them uh, should you need to, because you know sometimes they'll they will draw um, insects uh, to to the fresh new plants and you don't want that. That's bad. That's bad for your seedlings. So uh, it, it's a pretty good little article, um, not not really totally in depth, but uh, it gives you all the information you're going to need uh, should you be wanting to start a garden inside uh, in a very inexpensive manner. So uh, just just mark that, and you know you can have it later. I can, the, the, the post will be in the blog, so or the the link to the post will be in the blog, so you can check all that out, and it, it's, it's it's pretty cool. Shows you how to cut them for transplanting and all that stuff. So, 
it's all great. Yeah, I've got um, I'm, I'm I'm still preparing the ground outside for my garden, uh, which I plan on doing. Um, so that that should be coming up. Uh, well, I I was working on it last week. I'll be working on it more this week, assuming that we don't get another blizzard come through. <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> and we saved the uh, best. Well, we saved this for last. Anyway, whether it's the best or not, I don't know. Yourminds.org. Yourminds.org. British government goes into emergency session after failure to keep Gatwick UFO attack secret. You did what now? Oh, Rome's is pointing out that you have to pay attention uh, to to the ground temperature. Uh, that, that, that's that's the soil temps. That, that's that's a good way to do it, and the moisture there. That's good information. Thank you for that. Too wet, too cold. Seeds will rot. Yep, yep. Uh, paper rolls, toilet paper rolls in half and use them. Yeah, but there's no bottom. But there's no bottom. <laughs> Excuse me again. All right, so there it is. Oh, here it is. Here's an important question. Were UFOs seen over the Gatwick Airport and downplayed as drones to control the situation? It happened at a China airport back in China, uh, back in China, back in 2010, when a huge glowing UFO shot down, shut down, not shot down, shut down their airport uh, with many eyewitnesses getting great photos of the glowing UFO. It was hard to deny. It was impossible to deny. Not that they didn't deny it, but it was impossible to deny. <laughs> However, I cannot find any photos of a drone or UFO over the Gatwick airport, which is strange. I believe that people at the airport did not see the UFO, that it was only seen on radar zooming around the airport, that it would cause them to panic if it was uh, cloaked, causing them to panic from not being able to see it. This is written in a, a fairly odd way, but whatever. A grouping new ministry, what, a gripping, God, a gripping new ministry of foreign affairs, MOFA report, cir circulating in the Kremlin today, chiding London for never missing an opportunity to hinder Russian media in the UK, states that the British clampdown on press reporting is because they have become so unnerved over the UFO, UFO attack, which if it was just flying around, can you really call that an attack? But they, they are. Uh, the UFO attack on Gatwick Airport this past week. Uh, and that has now seen, uh, that has now seized, seen, I think they meant, Prime Minister Theresa May having gone into emergency session with her government after the drone story first put out by the propaganda mainstream media, the clap, was shut, shot down by police, thus causing the innocent couple arrested to be set up as patsies, having to be... Oh, the, that's right. You all remember the, the, the drone, the, the drone, quote-unquote drone that shut down Gatwick Airport. Not a drone. <laughs> yeah, it was indeed quite the uh, UFO uh, that was there that shut down the airport. Um, so, there you go. All right, folks. Um, that's going to be the last story for this particular week here on uh, Grim Leftovers. I'll be back again next Monday. Uh, hopefully my audio is good throughout and the audio card sounds good and uh, everything such as that. It feels good having it. Let me say, it really feels good having the proper equipment. Uh, once again, uh, I, I went through several other various sound cards trying to find one that would replicate what my old one did without actually buying the exact or close as possible to the exact model a previous sound card that I could get. And I finally gave up and um, got the one that I needed. <laughs> I wanted something more modern. 
but the modern ones just weren't doing it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern is Flash Somebody uh, in a Perfect World. Grammy will be on Wednesday night and Friday night at her normal time, 7 p.m. Eastern, with Grammy's Rocket Chair. Flash will be on once again on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern with 20% off. Vin E. comes on at, uh, he, he likes to say noon central, but 1 Eastern um, with his show Ponder Gander. Um, and, and, uh, then, yeah, Grammy at 7, and Freakers Ball at 11 p.m. Eastern, myself and the wonderful Mighty Moose Curl. Uh, Flash comes back on Saturday in on a dork table. Thank you, Sock. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh yeah, the dork table at, uh, 1 Eastern, or noon Eastern, noon Eastern, excuse me, on Saturday, uh, with Flash and, and maybe a, maybe a guest co-hosted. She, he, he gets them sometimes. I'll be doing the blues. We'll be playing the trivia here on Sunday on RLM Radio. Uh, so at, at noon Eastern, and that runs for three hours right up until Hal Anthony behind the woodshed opening up the big old can of whoop ass. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll talk to you later. Peace.